Um, so this is not going to have a lot of data in it. This is going to be more of a story. So I hope you'll be entertained and informed. Uh, I'll acknowledge my co-author, Tricia Pollock, who works for Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. Uh, I also work for Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, retired last year. Um, so um, just want to tell you about the Shelter Belt program in Canada, meaning the prairies of Canada, because that's where the program was delivered. Um, just to go into a little history, now we're going back to the 1670s in the fur trade. You see the shaded area there. Oh, first of all, this uh, triangle is the prairies, agricultural prairies of Canada, adjacent to the U.S. Great Plains. And uh, the shaded area in 1670, it was given to as a monopoly to the Company of Adventurers of England trading in Hudson's Bay, also known as the Hudson's Bay Company, which still exists as a publicly traded company, a uh, consortium led by Prince Rupert, nephew of Charles I. And that was as a result of sending one ship over into Hudson's Bay looking for beaver furs, came back loaded with good beaver furs, and led to this formation of this consortium that was going to make a million. And they operated continuously for uh, uh, until the 18, 1870s, so for 200 years, continued trading furs out of, uh, out of that area. The shaded area is actually the, all the waters draining into Hudson's Bay and James Bay. So they had a monopoly on all of that, so that goes all the way from northern Quebec. You can see how huge that area is. The queen or the king just said, okay, you can have that monopoly. <laughs> there you go. Kept them in the family. <laughs> now, oh, one thing I should show you is part of that uh, goes south of the 49th parallel. So this is North Dakota, this is Minnesota. Uh, the 49th parallel was subsequently agreed to as the international boundary between British North America and the United States. Uh, between the Lake of the Woods as far as the Rocky Mountains and then and that was in 1818 and then it, under the Oregon Treaty in 1846 it was extended through the mountains to uh, to the Pacific uh, not including Vancouver Island which remained part of British North America. <coughs> then in 1867 I call it British North America because it wasn't Canada yet at that time. 1867 was Canadian Confederation and um, under Canadian <clears throat> Confederation, the idea was that Hudson's Bay Company would give that monopoly back to the, to the English Crown, and then the Crown would turn around and <clears throat> give that to the Dominion of Canada. And uh, so that's what was supposed to happen, but because of bad timing, the people who already lived in the prairies, in, meaning the Métis or the mixed breed uh, native um, uh, white, people who were farming in the Red River Valley said, we don't know anything about this Canada business. That was basically in the East. And so they said, we want our own country. So they established, led by Louis Riel, uh, an independent Republic of Manitoba in 1869, which was rather short-lived because they sent the troops out from Ontario and uh, chased the uh, Métis leadership away. and subsequently gave Manitoba provincial status in 1870. In 1871, the colony of British Columbia voluntarily, by referendum, their two choices were join the United States or join Canada, because Britain didn't want to keep them as a dependent colony. So they decided under referendum to join Canada with the caveat that they needed to be joined by rail to the rest of Canada within 10 years of signing. So that was 1871, so that put the, set the clock ticking to build a <coughs> railway across the prairies. In the 1870s, the other big thing that happened was the buffalo disappeared. Um, up till then, they seemed to be uh, numberless. So like you could, you could go and uh, uh, and to buffalo, which they did, and they kept on hunting buffalo until suddenly there were no more buffalo. Uh, the, the government of Canada in 1873 sent out the Northwest Mounted Police, which was a crew of about 200 redcoats, and they were supposed to maintain law and order in the entire prairies, which amazingly enough they did. 
Um, the Indian treaties were uh, assigned and the creation of Indian reserves so that the Indians, instead of chasing buffalo in the prairies, they tried to settle them down and turn them into uh, farmers. And uh, so, so all that had happened in 1873, Manitoba, which just a few years earlier had achieved uh, um, provincial status, started to bring in settlers. And that was part policy, but partly people said, oh, there's free land out there and things were not too good where they were coming from, Ontario and Quebec. So they came out to uh, Manitoba, to the new province. There were two other groups of ethnic groups that came in fairly large waves into the new province of Manitoba. One group was from Iceland and they came fleeing a volcano that had erupted. So there were shiploads of Icelanders that came down through Hudson Bay and down to Lake Winnipeg and they settled on the shores of Lake Winnipeg. So that's north of the city of Winnipeg. That's sort of in mixed uh, forest prairie land and uh, there's good fishing up there. The other group, and this is more significant, so this is maybe getting, finally getting into the agroforestry story. The <coughs> other big group were Mennonites. And if you know about Mennonites, they're a religious uh, group that um, had moved from fallen Germany into, um, into the steppes of Russia, into the Ukraine <coughs> and so forth. And they were fleeing persecution in Russia. They came as a fairly large group into the Red River Valley and settled in southern Manitoba. Now coming from the steppes of Russia, and I heard uh, Tom's presentation this morning about people coming from the east of the United States and not knowing what to do when they hit the Great Plains. These people knew exactly what to do. That's exactly the environment that they came from. So the first thing they did when they got into the open prairies of Canada is uh, they uh, started planting trees and they said, oh, this is great farm life, just like what we're used to back home. So uh, according to me, uh, from what I've read, these were the first shelter belt planters and they probably started planting them right away after they got, they got there in about 1873. Now remember the clocks ticking on the railway. <coughs> in uh, 1881 to 1883, the Canadian Pacific Railway crossed the prairies and this was part of a national policy because the government of Canada had promised BC that they would build a railway. And uh, so they wanted to make Can Canada into an actual country. I think there was also some concern that if they left all those prairies sitting open, eventually it would somehow get annexed to the United States and the opportunity would be lost. So John A. Macdonald and the Canadian government felt some pressure to get this railway done. And it was moving very slowly, um, uh, but uh, and so um, yeah, so it was happening very slowly, uh, and the, it was supposed to be happening. So the immigrants were coming out into the prairies, and no railway, right? So uh, it was happening slowly. In 1881, it got as far as Brandon, Manitoba, and uh, so then they thought, okay. We want to get this done. We need somebody who's going to do it. So they got Cornelius Van Horn, who was a uh, experienced railwayman from Chicago, and he had built lots of railways in the U.S. and he knew exactly how to do it. So he had all the logistics figured out. He started cracking the whip. He got the money. He got the government on side, and away they went. Starting from Brandon, Manitoba. They laid up to over approximately 300 miles in 1882. So they ended up uh, west of what's now Regina, Saskatchewan. And the next year they made it to the Rocky Mountains. In 1881, 28,000 settlers flooded into the prairies. And finally, the uh, last spikes were driven on the National Railway uh, in 1885. Uh, north of Lake Superior in uh, November 3rd and four days later in the Rocky Mountains, finally completing the, the national lifeline, sort of. And coming through North Dakota or through uh, uh, Montana, we learned that there was a parallel railway blasting across the northern United States. Two railways kind of going side by side, one <coughs> north of the border, one south of the border, uh, probably at the same speed with uh, James J. Hill. 
Um, okay, so part of that railway um, included a lot of settlers coming out and they were each promised a quarter section of the land as long as they homesteaded it and started tilling it, right? Cultivating it. So Winnipeg <coughs> became the boomtown gateway to the west. Then things kind of settled down for a while, and in 1896 there was a whole other wave of settlers that came out, this time mostly from Eastern Europe, from the Ukraine, and uh, so we had two kind of big waves of settlers that came, one in 1880, one in 1882, and then one in 1896 or thereabouts. Uh, now, so now we get to Indian Head. <coughs> Northwest Territories, this was before we became a province of Saskatchewan and before the province of Alberta, there was a province of Manitoba. But the Dominion of Canada said, with all these settlers out here, they need to know how to farm. A lot of them don't even know how to live out in the prairies. They're living in sod huts and so forth. We need federal government assistance to teach these people how to look after uh, animals, crops, and, uh, and uh, to, to learn how to um, grow vegetables and so forth out in the prairies. So they created uh, two experimental farms, one at Brandon, Manitoba, and one at Indian Head, Northwest Territories. And they got this guy, young Angus Mackay, who had come out as a homesteader, and they said, you're the guy to be the superintendent of our experimental farm at Indian Head. So Angus Mackay, he was quite an uh, uh, insightful person, and uh, first thing they needed was an improved wheat variety that would ripen within the short period and withstand the diseases. So they released this Marquis wheat, which was a game changer, really. It was uh, early maturing, uh, high yielding, and high protein. But the other thing that Angus Mackay was really dedicated to was making sure that people were happy and comfortable and that they had some food. So trees and shrubs for shelter and wood were a great part of what Angus Mackay was uh, uh, pushing. There's Angus. Um, so he was pushing that out of the experimental farm at Indian Head, but within a few years, people were saying, we need more of these trees and shrubs. And they were producing, first they started with trees and shrubs from Ontario, which weren't very hardy. They got some stuff from Siberia and Russia, which was very hardy, some introduced species, and they started producing uh, locally adapted species, green ash and some of those species that we are quite familiar with. And they brought in Norman Ross, who was a Scotsman, and he had graduated from forestry school in uh, Biltmore Forestry School, I think that's Maryland, I'm not sure. But anyway, he was a qualified forester. So they said, you're in charge, you get your own station. So they set up this forest nursery station at Indian Head. So we had two federal government stations there, one under the control of Angus Mackay and one under the control of Norman Ross. And uh, so from 1892, that's when Angus Mackay was still sending them out to 1930, they were sending out a lot of trees for farmyards to protect their houses and all planted by hand. And some field shelter belts, very few of them, but in the early 1900s, there were some field shelter belts going into Southern Manitoba. Again, these Mennonites who were quite familiar with trees were planting uh, single row shelter belts way back in the early 1900s. And there's a picture of the trees produced at Indian Head in 1917, getting ready to be shipped on train at the Indian Head train station. 1905, Indian Head became, pro or Saskatchewan and Alberta became provinces. Um, there was a fair bit of wind erosion because, you know, they were tilling up this virgin prairie soil and, uh, and um, there were some forward-looking farmers in Conquest, Saskatchewan. I'll show you that on a map in just a minute, who also started planting field shelter belts. Maybe they had seen what the Mennonites were doing in southern Manitoba. And then we have the 1930s. And in some way, Tom's history of what happened in the US, it's mirrored by what happened in Canada, because we also had economic depression and long-term drought in Canada. So, um, Many farmers actually abandoned their land. It was not, maybe they had 
started tilling land that should have never been tilled, but uh, major crop failures and big dust storms, causing the government of Canada to pass the Prairie Farm Rehabilitation Act. So it was an act of parliament. So they had this act, which was going to help prairie farmers survive through these tough times. To go along with that, they had to create an organization. So they created the PFRA, Prairie Farm Rehabilitation Administration, which then turned around and used federal government funding to fund a lot of conservation methods, as well as um, um, water accessing methods, like small dams and stuff like that, digging wells. So that's what PFRA was all about. And so for field shelter belts, they had um, their Lyleton, Manitoba, Conquest and Aneroid Saskatchewan. Those were planted in the late 1930s with the tree nursery, which was not controlled by PFRA, but provided all the seedlings, training, supervision and inspection of the plantings. So this is at Conquest, Saskatchewan, planting a field shelter belt Probably most, most of this was Terragana. If you're familiar with Terragana, Siberian pea shrub, Terragana arborescens is a shrub that grows to about 18, 20 feet in height. And these are the, these are the areas. So this is, first of all, this is uh, where the Mennonites first went. Since then, they spread out to other places. There's a fair number of Mennonites in some of these areas. But this is where they first went, into the southern Red River Valley, centered around Winkler, Manitoba. And uh, so there's a lot of shelter belts in here. Then under the 1930s program, it was Conquest, Saskatchewan, Aneroid, Saskatchewan, <coughs> Lyleton, Manitoba. So based on those, then people started seeing what shelter belts really could look like. And then they started spreading out across the prairies. You're clapping from yeah, the other three room. minutes and then you need to take some questions. Okay, all right. So I'm just going to flip through these. Um, so that came to mechanized planting. Uh, these are what they looked like after planting. A uh, major uh, education campaign with a tree planting car that went all over the prairies. Uh, 1980s was major new soil conservation, and I'll show you that on the graph in just a moment here. And, uh, but then, and I'll talk about this in a minute, I'll show you the graph first, and then we'll get into the 2000s and where we are. Um, by the way, 2013 was the last year of tree distribution out of our nursery at Indian Head, where I worked for 30 years. So it was just decided at the upper level by the Minister of Agriculture in spring of 2012, that the government of Canada would discontinue their 113 year program as a deficit cutting measure, expressing confidence that the private sector would provide uh, the needed uh, seedlings. Over the 113 years, over 700 million seedlings have been provided to prairie uh, farmers. <coughs> and so I just wanted to sort of finish with uh, this one. Um, on an average year, we could have somewhere around 6,000, 7,000 applicants they'd send in their application form. The trees would be sent out <coughs> in the springtime. And uh, two things I wanted to point out here. I mentioned major conservation programs of the 80s. 91 was the biggest year that we ever had. 11 million seedlings were sent out. So there's a lot of field shelter belts, even though the program ended that are very young and they're just coming into maturity. Um, so we have some of the struggles that Tom talked about with larger farms and we don't have that much center pivot irrigation, but older shelter belts are coming out. So I guess my question is, um, uh, what is agroforestry for the Prairie Provinces going to look like in the future? Um, this is our gang, including summer students and production staff. Um, I'll skip this slide. So uh, <coughs> I think one thing that we're looking at is instead of the federal government obviously delivering that kind of a program, that it's going to have to be delivered by a non-government kind of entity. And one thing that's been happening is the development of 
this organization called the Alternative Land Use Services, ALICE, and that's becoming a national organization. If you were at Prince Edward Island a couple of years ago, you would have heard about the pilot project of ALICE. So that's going to, maybe it's sort of operating a little bit like a CRP kind of program, but it's not delivered by government. So I think maybe I'll just end it there. And we have, we do have a few minutes for questions. Um, I would remind you, please repeat the question into your mic. So okay. Can capture sure. The, All right. Video. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, was there a charge? Uh, did the applicants pay for the seedlings? <coughs> there was never any charge for the seedlings. Uh, there was talk about <coughs> doing that, but there was never any charge for the seedlings. But Norman Ross, in the very early years, called it the Cooperative Tree Planting Program. So he said, the federal government provides the seedlings, all the rest of it is the responsibility of the landowner. So that includes tilling up the soil, keeping the weeds under control. So, you know, a 20 cent seedling or something or whatever it costs in those days would be nothing compared to all the sweat equity and so forth that the farmers are putting in. Yeah. Yeah, I just noticed that um, there was a, maybe it wasn't a coincidence, but it seems like the Canadian program and the American program are Dust bowl mitigation started about the same time. Yeah. The, the presentation earlier this morning was like, you know, Roosevelt had his thing going on 34, 35, and your presentation was like 17, 1935. I wonder if there was a coordination between the two um, governments. The one slide, uh, so the question was, was it a coincidence that Canada's tree planting program or field shelter belt program and the American one were happening at the same time? Obviously, they were both influenced by the same weather conditions, but uh, there was one slide that I had there about Canada-US collaboration. And starting with Norman Ross, who was educated in forestry in the United States, there's always been, at least in the Great Plains, a lot of connection between Canada and the United States. So our own organization, since I've worked there, which was since 1984, We've attended GPAC forestry committee meetings, so we've and we've actually had stock exchanges between North Dakota and Saskatchewan. So there was always that north-south linkage because we had so many things in common. Good time for one more question. Yeah, I just, yeah, so I was just curious if they've ended the seedling program, but is are there alternative programs within the government that support conservation cover, like those that kind of more you know, or maybe they support farmers through those practices that they don't provide them? Uh, question is, is there other forms of support for uh, agroforestry by the government? <coughs> um, at this point, the federal government, they back in the 80s, there were some major programs, but there are always oh. partnerships between federal government and provincial, partners, uh, provincial government, because agriculture is a shared jurisdiction, federal and provincial. Um, in some provinces like Ontario and Quebec, which have a large agriculture department, uh, the federal government would just, I mean, they still have their name on the thing, but basically they give the money to the province to deliver the program. In the prairies, it tended to be a little bit of heat. Um, so I think the federal government has basically uh, expected the provinces to deliver the programs. The provinces have also cut back for you know, deficit cutting reasons. So I don't think that they really want to take on new programs, even though there were huge programs back in the 80s, 1980s and 1990s. So now I think the model is um, to try and deliver through some third party uh, groups. So there are groups like Ducks Unlimited and so forth who, I don't know how much government funding they get, but this last group, Alice, is hoping to be a delivery agent for conservation programming. So I, I don't know exactly how that's going to go, but I kind of think that might be the model for the future. All right, let's thank John for his talk. And we'll have five minutes to switch rooms. And